That was Tar. Please welcome to the stage the film's writer, director, and producer, Todd Field. As Lydia Tar, Kate Blanchett. And as Sharon Goodno, Nina Hoss. Congratulations all on the film. I, I, I love that the first major scene in it is this incredibly erudite Q&A, which I'm now going to completely fail to live up to. Um, but Kate, I want to start by asking you about that scene, um, how you f felt your way through Lydia Tarr's different motives and agendas in there, because it, it, in one sense, there's this amazing piece of intellectual grandstanding that we're all slightly overawed by, but then beforehand we see these nervous tics and rituals that don't seem to match the character she's projecting. And then there's also this introduction of the theme of time, which becomes this, 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 this huge undercurrent in the, in the film itself. It's a really simple interaction, but there's a lot going on. So how did you kind of pull it apart and, and, and what kind of sense do you think it gives us of, of, of Lydia herself? Well, yes, it's a prologue of sorts to, to what you're going to see unfold. But also you don't realise you're witnessing someone in a way, performing themselves, as I am probably right now, <laughs> performing my familiar, very self-conscious indeed. Um, but it, you know, it was there also for another reason to table set the fact that that this woman knew her onions and that had an unassailable right to be in the position that she was, and so you had to believe. You know, she understood the history of the art form, was um, passionately invested in the art form, um, and that that she was in control of her relationship to the audience, or or perceived at least that she was, and um, and so it served a lot of different functions. I mean, f for for me as a non musician, uh, you know, I had to do a lot of homework to intimately understand <laughs> what it was that she was talking about. <laughs> um, and I think I had the experience that perhaps an audience might have in anticipation of, 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 of sitting down and listening to a long interview is that I had to uh, make intellectual sense immediately of all of that stuff. But of course, it makes rhythmic sense. Um, yes, but it was a it was a challenge. And um, Adam was a great scene partner, an old hand at that. And the way Todd chose to shot it, to shoot it, made um, complete sense to me. I mean, I had this experience, and I'm sure you do, Nina, when, when you're on stage, there's a moment where you feel um, that you are standing in exactly the right place in relation to the other actors, in relation to the audience, and therefore the text is able to flow through in a meaningful way. And I felt that not just on in that particular scene, but all the time with Todd, is that we were always placed in in the exact right position. So it made spatial sense as well, like three dimensional sense. That probably doesn't answer your question, but yeah, it was complicated. <laughs> Todd, a similar question to you. Um, which of Lydia's qualities and flaws first um, insisted themselves upon you when you first dreamt up this character? You know, where did she come from, and what what to you was the the absolute essence of her in the first place? Well, I, th I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of imagined um, this child, you know, um, this child sort of growing up in a very particular set of circumstances with uh, a proximity to the largest landfill and at that time on Earth, uh, Fresh Kills in Staten Island. Um, this is obviously just inside baseball stuff because you don't see that in the film, but a rubbish dump, basically. A rubbish dump, yeah, um, and. Um, you know, uh, with immigrant parents and uh, limited exposure to to culture such as it is, um, who at a certain point stumbles across Leonard Bernstein, you know, um, who is such a great advocate and um, seducer for all of us. You can't he he could convert anyone into falling in love with concert music, you know, and um, and she ran toward it, and that was her salvation. And she's with an open heart and. Um, for all the reasons that that one does, she chased that dream, you know, and she wanted to make music in such a manner. Um, and then, you know, um, things change. Uh, things change in her life um, based on different chapters of her life. And what would it be like to have such a child actually attain those dreams um, as they're in entering midlife, you know, turning fifty? Um, 
and the sort of catastrophe of actually achieving your dreams and and what it would take for a child such as that from limited means to have their um, their their reach exceed their grasp, so to speak, in terms of the the concessions that people have to make um, because she's dealing with this. Ultimately, she's dealing with this large bureaucracy. She's sitting atop a, a, a pyramid of power, um, and her life is bifurcated from being that musician she wanted to be to being many other things that perhaps she isn't so well equipped to deal with. Well, Nina, I think that speaks uh, brilliantly to Sharon's role in in, in in Lydia's life because I think on on the one hand, Lydia's this kind of super powered outsider in Berlin, and but. But Sharon isn't the sort of put upon housewife, right? She's very much a part of the tar project, and there are there are some. I mean, it's it's, it's the, the smallest smallest gesture, but there's a scene where you're demonstrating, I think, sports sando to the to the orchestra, and it's just one jupe. But you can tell from that, like she's her position in the orchestra. She knows how bolstered it is by her relationship with Lydia. I think. So so tell me about f sussing out the the dynamic between those two and. And 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 uh, you know, you playing to this idea that you know she she has something that you know she's invested in this for her her own reasons as well. I think. Yeah, it was interesting. This particular <laughs> moment <laughs> was uh, somewhat terrifying because I do play the pieces that you see me playing, but so that I don't mess up because what you hear and what you see is live. It's a little muted. <laughs> I forgot about it. <laughs> And I stood up and I went, let's do it a little bit uh, closer. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it sounded terrible. <laughs> and everyone was kind of shocked. And I had the biggest laugh attack <laughs> because <laughs> you're such an imposter. You know, it was it was terrible. But it, it, so that was one thing. But being in the orchestra and watching Wolfgang Hendrich, for example, who, who is the real concert master of the Dresdner Philharmonie with whom we were working, you, you can tell how much he has to navigate and how much of a translator between, in this case, Todd was the conductor, but also with Kate, to translate for the film also what, what every orchestra member sh is up for and how to get them there and how to get them to be five more minutes on the seat and to just, you know, he spoke with everyone in a different way, like a, like a psychiatrist in a way, you know. So he, I thought, oh my God, this position really demands a lot. You have to be an incredible musician, but also you have to have such fine senses for every musician <laughs> in this orchestra and work them for the conductor to to fulfill her vision you know and i th i always thought sharon really loves that she really enjoys it and that's her passion and that's why she loves her because they can bring these symphonies to a height you know where sharon has never expected to be able to achieve that so that's what she gets out of it and she gets the glam out of it and they're the couple of berlin you know i mean i know how it is that someone who would lead a the one big orchestra in Berlin, you're invited all the time. You travel the world, you know. So, you, so what is it that keeps this system, this power system, <laughs> upright? You know, when does Sharon decide not to ask a question, or when does she enable certain things? Although I always had the feeling Sharon, by putting Olga in the orchestra or giving her the the solo. It's because she's the better musician. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. But uh, concerning the the relationship, that was the fun for me to work with with uh, Kate and Todd on these nuances uh, of this relationship that's slowly slipping away. She's slipping away, and Sharon tries to <laughs> to hold on to it and uh, th doesn't quite achieve it. And then how to come to this point where she says now I got to take my life into my own hands and it's my career and it's uh, our daughter that I have to protect. So this clarity uh, to, to come to that, that was really fascinating to work on. Kate, uh, Nina mentioned um, her technical ability to, to, to play the, the violin there. On a purely technical level, when you're working out how to conduct, 
was there anything that Lydia said about the the art in the screenplay that you found particularly helpful, or or was there something else that you were able to draw on to to, to work out how to convincingly lead an entire orchestra in this in this really charismatic way? It's 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 interesting. We were just talking to Alice Farnham tonight, who's just launched a book about you know um, trying to to articulate the art of conducting, and often um, artists conductors in this in, in instance are from quite inarticulate ab ab about what it is that we do and the thing and the way we choose to express or explain what it is that we do is often contrary to the way we actually do it so because I, I I know working in the theater for, for a long a long time there's a great level of superstition because there's a um, without wanting to get too highfalutin about it there's a shamanistic quality to what you do and you think this tonight it may not happen it may, we may not lift off tonight. And so um, va various sort of ticks and superstitions creep, creep in. And also you want to keep um, the art very close to your, to your chest. Um, so I, I, you know, like Todd was alluding, I, I thought about her background and there are various aspects of her background that we sort of um, in, invented about the way she grew up in quite a silent household and and the, how that might, um, her acute sensitivity to, to, to sound might uh, affect the way she conducts. So, um, you know, I, I, I watched masterclasses, rehearsals um, and performances of a myriad of different directors and and um, and ultimately the whole thing for me came, the freedom was that I, you know, I mean, it, of course it's so obvious, but I'm quite slow, that, that conducting is, is, a, is a consummate form of, of communication and that it's not just about what the left hand does and how it might shape uh, various parts or aspects of, of, of any given symphony mm -hmm. and the time which is beat with, with the right hand. But you've got your facial postures, you've got simply the presence of, of, of the conductor that once you have been working with a group of people, and this often happens with any ensemble, is that you have a shorthand. And um, a, a friend of mine, Natalie Murray Bill, who was helping me with the initial stages of, of, of conducting, she's a conductor herself, told a story about a friend of hers who was guest conducting for the BPO and he was really trying to work really hard to elicit a particular sound from from the orchestra I can't remember what what piece he was conducting and all of a sudden after two hours and you know they're very strict about their rehearsal time and he was running out of rehearsal time the sound changed and he went oh, I've got it we're there and he turned around to to check the time with someone and Claudio Abado who was the principal conductor, had just walked in. And simply by the fact that he had walked into the circle, the orchestra sound changed. So, so there is this, this um, it's, a, it's a form of alchemy, you know. Um, and so once I started to think about that, almost thinking about it as a, um, a form of dance, I had a lot more freedom you know, rather than thinking I had to get it right because the conductors are so idiosyncratic. And of course, this is a process film. It's not a, it's not a film about performance. And, you know, I innately understand. I, I you know, want to die in a rehearsal room. I love rehearsing so much. I find it so interesting, um, you know, that the way a conductor rehearses, the way musicians play in rehearsal is so entirely different than the way they, they play in, in performance. So um, it was about trying to, to find with Todd and with Natalie to go through the, the, the score and pick out sections that would show, um, you know, a dynamic range of not only Lydia Tarr's emotional state um, and the the type of musician that she that she was is, because um, of course she's a real person, um, but 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 also to how it would advance the 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 narrative. And so I, I thought about it in in that you know rather than, you know, this is not a film about conducting, so I don't know if that answers your question. Very, no, it, very it, it does, and, and Todd, actually, to, to pick up on that, um, mm -hmm. this sense of finding the piece in rehearsal rather than in performance, and actually Nina alluded to this too, the film, the finished film is very careful with what information it equips the audience with to, to, to find its way through uh, this story. Uh, even something as pivotal as the, the nature of, 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 of Tara's dealings or, or, or relationship with Krista, we are kept in the dark. So what I'm thinking is when you're writing, 
did you have this stuff built like like scaffolding or something that you could then take down around the film and then the film itself would stand on? How, and how do you how do you make the decision in terms of what to remove and what's the the additional fun for the audience, the pleasure? in not having those things to hold on to, do you think? What are the consequences for the actors? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, this thing is, you know, as Kate said, it's not really about conducting, it's not really about classical music. It's a, that's a perfect backdrop to uh, illustrate the ideas of the lines of power. You know, the film is really examining what happens to people that hold power, uh, what people are complicit to that, the scaffolding of, of power. Um, and um, I think, you know, we have a fair amount of history in terms of um, the patriarchal power um, that we all have our own opinions about uh, rightly. Um, and uh, so what does that look like, you know? Um, how, do you, how do you walk around something um, that in a in this time we're living in, um, when we're not allowed to have a great deal of time, and and have to make decisions as a practical matter to get on with your day, um, and and what do we know and what do we not know? Well, we we don't know very much. Um, the tempo with which we're assimilating, you know, information such as it is, is incredible. We've never lived in a period of time like this in in human history. So. Um, that that was sort of the guiding light in terms of what we would know for sure, what we would not know, what would might be alluded to. But the main thing was to sort of say, this we built this thing for the audience. We built this thing so that the audience is the final filmmaker, so that the audience can come in and they can be judge and jury or or whatever. Uh, it it was the main thing was to not be pointing one way or the other too much. And so the challenge uh, was both in the execution in terms of our conversations and rehearsal and, and, and in production. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, it was with Monica Willey, my, my editor, the great Monica Willey. Um, <laughs> you may know she's edited most of Michael Hannity's films and, and Louis Hanish's films, and she's a, a very, very fine editor. Um, and so we, ref we would refine it even more after, a after production with the same ideal that the three of us had up here. And, um, which was um, asking ourselves the same questions that, that maybe you would ask, you know? Um, and those answers changing uh, every time that we would watch the film down. And then we'd take a few days off and then we'd come back and we'd say, how did you feel today about her? And it, and it, was, a, it was just trying to get to that point where um, we, had, we could get to a, a point with the structure of the film to where our opinions varied depending on when we watched it and the time of day and what had happened and what we brought to it, et cetera, et cetera, so that we could really have a conversation amongst us like the three of us had, had when we were making it, which is um, what does power ultimately do, you know, um, and who benefits from it? Um, and, uh, and it's not a unidirectional phenomenon power. It, it, it's implicitly complicit. I, I, I love that part of... Um the, the tragedy of Tar, I think, is that she's she's approaching this career peak at the precise moment in history where that power is no longer as protective as it once was. Uh, even though she's not the kind of stereotypical sleazy show business mogul, she's she's suddenly able to be taken down in ways via, via technology, as we see. At what point, when you were writing the film, did you realise that these these kind of themes and like you know the the reckoning that's going on? How do we weigh an artist's work? Is it to do with you know identity? Is it to do with the, the work itself? Is it to do with uh, uh, you know their, their their personal conduct? All of these 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 really kind of topical concerns now. How far into the screenplay were you before you, you, you when you realised that these these have to be a part of the discussion? Well, I mean, it really the first scene that I wrote was a Juilliard scene with the, with this with Tar and 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 the student, um, and that scene. Um, sort of is the, um, for me, is the um, Rosetta Stone for the film, you know. Um, you meet her, um, she's in control, seemingly in control. She has the power in that scene. Uh, it, it implicitly, she has more agency. Um, she has a willing audience, a captive audience. Um, and what is the first thing that she does? The first thing she does is she 
asks the student why they're there. Um, and then she slowly chips away at his selection of music. Okay, so who wrote the piece of music? Well, it was Anna Thorv's daughter, you know, a, a, a well, a, you know, a, a, a much lauded, well sung contemporary composer that um, is much younger, is female, um, and by the character's own account, is a super hot young woman, right? Um, that was a joke. <laughs> But I mean, that's that, but that's where the scene begins, right? So, it, she's in terms of separating, and then there's the separating the art from the artist. She's talking about Bach with the student. And the student is pushing back about this. Um, so, on the one hand, there's Lydia Tarr talking to her younger self because she very much was the student at 24. She really didn't care about canonical work. She didn't care about dead white man music. She didn't care about any of that. She was trying to break glass ceilings, and she was doing that. On the other hand. Um, she's at a point in time, she's 50 years old, and she is playing that music now. She's not her 24-year-old self. Um, and so in a way, she's having a conversation with herself, right? And um, so in terms of, you know, in terms of the, the sort of takedown of this character, in terms of the sort of modern um, machinery of the takedown of the character, um, that's just what's in the air because this is set in a contemporary you know, in November 2022, three weeks in essentially, except for the denouement in November 2022. Um, but at, at, at the end of the day, you know, um, there's an element of scandal. And if this had been placed 10 years ago, there would have still been the tools of her own destruction constructed by her. Um, and also the other thing she says, the last thing that she says in that scene is obliterate yourself. And she's very much on her way to doing that. Whether she's doing it consciously or not, she knows that she's never going to get beyond probably to the next peak, right? Because everything's in the rear view mirror. And this is something Kate was talking a lot about, which is you know, that the death of an artist is legacy or, or being concerned with legacy. So um, that's a long digressive. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm answering your question. I don't know. Very, very much so. Um, let's open this to, to the audience. If you've got any questions, hold your hands up. And I think we've got microphones, have we? Let's start with this one. As um, an up and coming, because I've been told not to say aspiring, actor myself, I would love from both of you your advice um, as a new actor. Please and thank you. <laughs> advice. Um, I suppose it depends what, you, what you're interested in. I think it's, you know, in the end it's, it comes down to instincts, doesn't it? Instincts and opportunity. And, um, I mean, I can only speak from personal experience, but um, coming out of drama school um, and a lot of people in my year getting agents and I didn't get an agent and I went with someone who actually believed in me um, and who probably had a highfalutin senses of what I w should be doing and kept telling me to turn things down, like understudying, um, you know, a, a bunch of amazing actors because I got to go on stage for, for two weeks. You shouldn't be doing that, she said. I said, yeah, I should because I could see the opportunity that I would get to go on stage and I would get to be in a rehearsal room and... And so what, what doesn't often look like an opportunity from somebody else's point of view when they're, they're already end-gaming what your career is going to look like, I think it's, there's a lot of opportunities there and things that, that look insignificant. Um, and I don't know about you, Nina, but I was never on a path to get anywhere in particular. And I think that people often think about, um, you know, it's... You, you, to have a sense of a three, four, or five year fantasy plan is a good thing because it gives you a framework. Um, but, but then to be open to opportunities that, that present, present themselves that might seem to derail that plan, I mean, in the end, that allows you to live your life in parallel to living your um, life as, a, uh, as an actor, I think. Yeah, I think uh, I was hesitant because it's such a general question. <laughs> I would maybe add 
don't take things too personal, <laughs> you know, because you won't get every job that you wish for, but go after the ones that you really want to do and know why you want to do them, you know, because then they find you. I, I, it's my experience. It's, it's the same thing. I never thought about where I would end up. Or so. I never thought I was in a, I would be in a movie. I, I thought my thing was stage, you know, I was so focused on, on the stage work and then just to stay open and curious. <laughs> And then if things don't go your way, then it's not meant to be. The next thing will, <laughs> you know. So don't take it too personally. Hi, thank you so much. Um, the second time I've seen this, I'm getting quite obsessed with it, Lis <laughs> listening to every podcast, your editor and your DOP. Um, I suppose I'm interested in what Todd just said about classical music being the backdrop to what the film's really about. Second time round, your understanding or the understanding in the film of what music is seemed more advanced and deeper than I think last time. How much of the writing was a research project for you and how much was fed from your innate love or understanding or passion for classical music? I was a jazz player um, and I went to university on a music scholarship um, and I was a real snob, you know. Um, I didn't like anything that wasn't straight up jazz. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when you talk to musicians uh, of any stripe, whatever, you know, ability as they age, if they continue to, to be musicians, um, fortunately they drop the certainty of youth and they realize it's all noise, right? And these are just labels. Um, so I think as I aged, I had a much broader appreciation of, of music and I fell in love with classical music, you know, with the sort of um, open heart of an amateur listener. I didn't know very much about it and I, I still wouldn't pretend to know very much about it. So um, yes, it was a huge deep dive for research for me. Um, I always have this allergy when I watch films about people that make movies. We many of us in this room know what it's like to make a movie and then you watch a film and you say, well, that's really cute, you know? Um, <laughs> so it, it, I just, the, the goal was to not have like a toy town version of an orchestra. Um, and it, I started the script at the beginning of the first lockdown in March, 2020. And I called up uh, 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 two wonderful people at Universal Music Group, uh, Mike Noblock and Natalie Hayden, and I said, I'm starting this thing, but I can't start it without doing, um, without speaking to a conductor or, or an educator, uh, more importantly. Um, do you have anyone in mind? And I, they knew nothing about the script. They didn't know, and they knew nothing about the character. I think a lot of people presumed certain things that they were, you know, that were not to be. Um, and uh, they said, well, have you ever heard of this man, John Malcheri? And I said, yes, I just finished his book. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it's called For the Love of Music. I highly recommend it if you have any interest in reading. It's highly readable, especially if you're not a conductor. Um, they said, well, we think that he would, he has time, you know, and because John is a conductor and he couldn't leave. No, no one could make any music. So he agreed to sort of take me on in a crash course, sort of master class for about four weeks. Um, and that was time well spent, and that's before I ever started writing. Um, John had an interesting background in that he was Leonard Bernstein's assistant for 15 years. Um, he also was the only person that was ever allowed to conduct uh, Leonard Bernstein's own compositions while, while Bernstein was still living. He taught at Yale. Um, but mo mo you know, just as importantly, he had for many years conducted at the Hollywood Bowl for the LA Phil for music nights. So he'd spent a lot of time around movies and movie people. And so he wasn't bothered like a lot of people might be that aren't around films um, by a lot of you know, seemingly um, practical questions. You know, like there's this little move I wanna do with you know, this cellist, blah, 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 blah. Is that practical? No, but maybe you would try this out or the other thing. So, that was about four weeks with him, and then I sat down and, and wrote the script. Uh, but the main thing, uh, as Kate was saying, it was, it was really important that we believe that she knows her onions, right? Not that we know it. Um, and so the references that she's, that she's making 
Um, some of them are, you know, arcane references. Some of them are very, very specific that one wouldn't know in this. They were highly, highly steeped uh, in this milieu, you know. Um, and John had a very particular uh, sort of access to to very special places that not many people who walk the planet do. Hi, um, I was interested in the character of Olga and her motivation and, and kind of how deliberate her sort of destructive or sab sort of the way she sabotages Tart, you know, at the end of their relationship with the social media and so on. Is that opportunistic on her part? Does she sort of, was she always intending to be that kind of angel of death in a sense? I just, I, I, their relationship's very interesting and I just wanted to ask you more about that. That's a very interesting take. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. It's something we talked about that Kate and Sophie and I t spoke about. Um, like, how much does she know? You know, um, she's the one character where uh, the idea of what transpires in terms of these power relationships is seemingly on the surface inverted, as if she doesn't care about any of it, and that is also a tactic potentially. Right or not, you know. Um, uh, but I've heard this reading uh, about this relationship um, from other people, um, and and there's been speculation on, um, you know, there's essentially four points of view in the film. Uh, the first one is sort of omnipotent. You know, you don't know who's on the other side of that device, and as if, if this was a uh, uh, Shakespeare, you know, um, Lydia Tarr could be the king asleep the night before going into battle, and this could be a, you know, a, a foot soldier coming in and maybe just fingering a dagger, and you're wondering, are they going to plunge the dagger into the belly of the king or not? You know, maybe it's just a nervous tick. Who knows? So, um, I think that possibility is um, is certainly something we talked about, but we really didn't make any decisions that, that one way or the other. Again, it was the idea of um, uh, t you know, choose your own adventure, right? But, but except, I mean, I, I, I do think at the point where Olga started to a a enter the narrative, the actual filmmaking, the perspective um, starts to shift into a much more elastic territory. For example, when, when Tar goes down to, to ostensibly return her little talisman, the bear, she ends up in a hearing a siren call and ending up in a, in a wet bunker being chased by a dog. And you think, how do we get here? Except somehow it makes some sense. So it's, uh, you know, I, I sort of increasingly began to think about it as, as the, the calling of a muse. Because there's so many things at play um, in the first part of the film and, and a lot of things have been um, beautifully excised by, by Todd and by, by Mona in, in the edit. And Todd keeps saying, you know, that these things are homeopathically there. And I think that's the power of Todd as a director is he doesn't spoon feed an audience. He trusts that you can, through viewing it and discussion, you can you can draw all of these textures out yourself. But she's about to, to turn 50. She's at the end of a teaching cycle. She's reaching the end of a performance cycle. And perhaps if things had gone a different way, she would have handed in her resignation and gone back down the UK Ailey Valley with the Shipibo Kanigo people and pursued ethnomusicology, who knows. But, but this young musician at the beginning of her career who's got so much fire and, um, and a healthy, exuberant lack of consequence w is, um, is, is pre presented to this encumbered um, musician that Tar is with a weight of, res of institutional power on her shoulders. And she thinks, I want some of that freedom. I want some of that, that energy. And she runs towards it. And so we, we enter through Olga, I think, into a very, very different psychological territory in the, in the, in, in the film. That, so the film starts to make sense on a whole other level because she's introduced into the narrative. Have we got another spare hour to talk about how the film shifts at the end? <laughs> I'm being told no. That's sadly all we've got time for. But Todd, Kate and Nina, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks.